Good morning. Are we on okay? Okay, great. God has brought us to a house this day, and I think it's interesting that the weather is working so well as the Lord would bless. Last Sunday, awesome, outside. This Sunday, we plan to be inside anyway. Here we are. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. And that rain always reminds us of how God's word works and accomplishes his purpose, which is our reason for being here today, so that God can work on our hearts and make our faith grow or establish it for the first time if we're hearing this and listening and wanting, just wanting to know Jesus. He is the bread of life that feeds us for now. Next week, he'll be the bread of life that feeds us forever. Pastor Godrich is really good at putting these themes together and, and seeing how the readings go. We'll continue in, in uh, John chapter 6 today in the gospel lesson and next week as well. Today, feeding the hungry is one thing that people talk a lot about, but we all have to realize what's really hungry before the body even is deep inside all of us in our soul. God feed us so that we can share with others who need help body and soul. Today, the entrance hymn is on page three. We'll sing the first stanza, rise for the, the final stanza. There are only two. And then uh, follow the worship folder as printed. God bless our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness 
and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, Uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Merciful Father, you gave your Son Jesus as the heavenly bread of life. Grant us faith to feast on him in your word and sacraments, that we may be nourished unto life everlasting. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture lesson takes us back to 1500 B.C. out in the wilderness with Moses and the Israelites. They would have been starving, but God gives them the bread of heaven, which foreshadows Jesus, the bread of life. From Exodus 16, 15 to 31. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, Mana, Mana, what is it? because they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given to you as food to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. All of them are to gather as much of it as they need to eat. They are to take an omer per person based on the number of people each of you has in your tents. The Israelites did this, and some gathered more, some less. When they measured it with the omer, The one who gathered more did not have too much, and the one who gathered less did not have too little. All of them gathered as much as they needed to eat. 
Moses said to them, No one is to leave any of it until morning. However, they did not listen to Moses. Some of them left part of it until morning, and it became full of worms and stank. So Moses was angry with them. They gathered it each morning. All of them gathered as much as they needed to eat. When the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers for each person. And all the leaders of the community came and reported to Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a complete rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. But set aside for yourselves all the rest of it to be kept until morning. So they set it aside until morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Today eat whatever is left over. For today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find any around the camp. Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather it, but they did not find any. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you people refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? Look, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he will give you two days' worth of bread. All of you are to eat where you are to stay where you are. None of you are to leave your places on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel called it manna. manna. What is it? It looked like white coriander seed, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. The word of the Lord. Our psalm is Psalm 34, which deserves to be marked in your Bible. We only have some of the verses here. A beautiful, comforting one. We'll sing responsibly as printed. Happy the people the Lord has chosen to be his own. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and are attentive to their cry. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Happy the people the Lord has chosen to be his own. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Lord redeems his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Happy the people the Lord has chosen. To be his own. Please rise. We'll save the second lesson for the sermon text reading in a few minutes and go to the verse of the day to read together at the top of page 9. Alleluia. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. My Father will love him, 
and we will come to him and make our home with him. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel continues in John chapter 6. This is verses 24 to 35. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I tell you. You are looking for me because you saw the miraculous signs. Not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not continue to work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So they said to him, What should we do to carry out the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. Then they asked him, So what miraculous sign are you going to do that we may see it and believe you? What miraculous sign are you going to perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I tell you. Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said to him, give us this bread all the time. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. The one who comes to me will never be hungry, and the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. The hymn 411 has a story that's in the margin. You can read that as you have time. So comforting. What a friend we have in Jesus.
God sent his, his greetings. He does. It's in one of the Psalms I stumbled onto that one night. God sends his greetings. What a blessing to know that he's thinking about us and just wants us to understand his deep and abiding love. As we come today to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the select verses there at the bottom of page 8, we find that God is faithful to lesson from sacred history. Be careful not to fall. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. He had them die in the wilderness. All these things that were happening to them had meaning as examples, and they were written down to warn us to whom the end of the ages has come. So let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. No testing has overtaken you except ordinary testing. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. But when he tests you, he will also bring about the outcome that you are able to bear it. The word of the Lord we pray. Lord, sanctify us through your truth. Your word is truth. May our whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until your coming. You are faithful, O Lord. In you we hope. Amen. In the name of Christ, our rock, dear fellow pilgrims bound for the promised land, and all who want to be. It may just be a story, another example of rather lame pastor's humor. So a pastor walks into the house of uh, a shut-in, a widow, who's known to have a sweet tooth. So he's a little surprised when she offers him a bowl of peanuts just peanuts. I really like the chocolate, she says, and the candy coating, but I don't really care much for the peanuts. <laughs> I don't know, but I guess you can imagine that the, the pastor did not accept her gracious offer. She said the peanuts hurt my teeth. I don't know gross, disgusting, but very much the way we tend to treat, we tend to treat God that way. Leftovers. We just like the candy coating. We just like the chocolate. It's just something that came to mind with all the eating going on and these these references. And then this text, which if you look at the, the theme in parts, I can just imagine somebody in our day and age looking at this and saying, I don't want to hear that. I mean, if, if in this late modern era people think there is a God, yeah, they like the word faithful. God is faithful. <laughs> you don't want somebody promising and then breaking their promises, right? And the second part, that's fine. You have God to provide. As long as it's what I want, when I want, mostly candy. But oh, to punish? Who wants a God that punishes? Don't you hear that over and over again? Our culture does, just doesn't like the idea of punishment. If there's a problem with crime, get rid of the police. You'll have less crime reported, they say. We've got to have a solution somehow to all of this because no punishment until someone hurts someone you love. Well, then maybe they should be punished. 
But, yeah, crimes against humanity, those guys should be punished. And those who abuse women and children, that's got to be punished. And the really bad one, whoever is intolerant, you got to make sure they just shut up. The government ought to do something about that, right? We need another law. <laughs> You've heard it. So, does it really hold in our culture that we don't want people being told what they have to do and everybody should just be able to do what they want when they want as long as nobody's hurt? But officer, we just wanted to see what their house looked like at 3 o'clock in the morning. We weren't going to hurt anybody. But I just took your car. I didn't hurt you. What is hurt? Do we really have a clue what we want or what we need? God is faithful. And God is God in his holiness, in his love. He punishes and he provides. And the closer you look as you kneel at the cross, the more grateful you can be for all of this. God is faithful. God is faithful and uh, the holy apostle literally says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Um, that has a bit of baggage in English today. It doesn't mean stupid. It just means you don't know. So we translate, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud as all, and all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So it helps to have Sunday school background and, and remember those stories. Uh, might help to watch the old movie, The Ten Commandments. Some of it is not too bad. 430 years to the day, it says in Exodus, to the day, God delivered his people, who most of that time were slaves. He forced Pharaoh with ten dreadful plagues to finally let his people go. And then opened wide the Red Sea, really wide, not like in the movie. Estimates are that two to three million people, as the Bible says, had to get over overnight. That's got to be at least three miles wide. A little hard to picture in a film. They had to get over overnight, and all of that happened. That's what God was doing, and that's what God said. They passed under the cloud, which was the visible evidence of the invisible God, who is a spirit like the wind. Same word in the Hebrew, same word in the New Testament Greek, the wind. They wanted to see the presence of the Lord, so God gave them a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day that turned into a pillar of fire at night and kept their, their camp lit up and all passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, baptized here used in a sense of being put under the responsibility of. Think about your baptism. This is meant to, to remind you of that. You are put into the name of God, his responsibility. And some of you have known Christians who wandered far and wide and you kept praying and loved ones kept praying and God brought them back because his name was on them. He loves to bless. He loves to restore. But these Israelites were Moses' responsibility. Your people, one place, God said, when God was angry, and Moses had to turn that around and say, wait a minute, they're your people that you brought out of Egypt. But they became Moses' responsibility in the sea and under the cloud, and there were miracles after miracles after miracles day after day. Two to three million people. Didn't know the source. Apparently there was an army quartermaster who ran the numbers and came up with just unimaginable logistics to take care of that many people in the wilderness. We're talking a couple of train cars, freight trains, a mile long each to supply food 
This is, you know, without the manna. <laughs> if this was all on Moses, firewood. Multiple trains just coming with firewood just to cook and water. It would have had to have been continuous caravans of tanker trucks and tra- tanker cars to provide, the estimate was, 11 million gallons of water a day. And God did it. With the rock, with the manna, came down at night. It was like dew on the ground. You heard the instructions. And you heard how the Israelites broke them right away. And the Lord was angry and Moses was upset because this is how the Lord is testing your faith and your obedience. If you, if you listened and, and maybe marked or circled the word spiritual a couple times here, there's spiritual food, spiritual drink, and a spiritual rock. They're really eating. And it's miraculous provision from the Lord. But there's something going on here that's also very spiritual that shows up in a negative way when they won't follow instructions. Spiritual eating, spiritual drinking. It may remind you of the other sacrament, our Lord's Holy Supper. Clear instructions from Scripture that God wants us to be on the same page In fellowship, that's why we practice close communion with members of our our fellowship, the Wisconsin Synod. It's what God commands because he loves us. A blessing. He doesn't want it to be a curse if people would come unprepared. That's what he says. There's There's a physical eating there and there's a spiritual eating and drinking that's going on at the same time. The rock, it's spiritual. But the ancient rabbis, I guess, did have a legend that some chunk of the rock from Kadesh where the water flowed out, that that chunk of rock actually physically followed them so they could see that. Looks like Paul is setting that aside here by saying this is the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock is Christ. He was just there with them constantly, as Christ is always with us. He accompanied them, that rock was Christ, and since they were not following instructions, you know the worst of it. They finally, after Mount Sinai, about three months, they finished crossing the wilderness rather quickly and then sent spies into the promised land, 12 spies, and only two of them came back and said, we can do this, Joshua and Caleb. All the rest of them got the people all frightened of the giants in the land and all of the rest of trying to conquer the promised land, and the people rebelled. And what they were complaining, grumbling to the Lord was that our children are going to die in the wilderness. So the Lord said, okay, you're not going in now. You'll wander for 40 years. These children that you said would die in the wilderness, they'll get to get into the promised land. I'll preserve them. I'll get them there. But the rest of you? All the men 20 years and upward, those rebellious dads, all died. Bones buried in the sand, scattered in the wilderness. Because God was not pleased with most of them, he had them die in the wilderness. Do you want a God who punishes? Well, you can make up your own if you don't. But God is God, and God is faithful. Be not deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. He is who he is, and God is love. It is his essence, and his mercy triumphs over his judgment. You see that again and again when when the Lord was so angry he wanted to destroy the Israelites like the golden calf and he's ready to make Moses into a nation and Moses says, no, they're your people that you brought out of Egypt. And then the Lord tells Moses what his name, the Lord, means. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, keeping love, mercy to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands, but punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Well, do the math. A thousand generations of blessing for those who listen and take his word to heart and 
three or four generations of pain and punishment where the children continue to follow in the evil footsteps of their parents. If your parents were rebellious against God, it does not mean you have to be. And just because your parents are faithful doesn't mean you automatically will be either. It all comes down to do you listen, do you hear? And when you're asking, what does all this have to do about us? It's a fair question, but the verses in between are the ones where the real warnings take place. Let me just read those to you. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 to 10. Now these things took place as examples to warn us not to desire evil things the way they did. In other words, stop pushing for God's candy and leaving behind the leftovers for him. Do not be come idolaters like some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to celebrate wildly golden calf right and let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell let us not put Christ to the test as some of them did and so were being destroyed by the serpents and do not grumble Wow, if you thought you escaped the other ones, (laughs) do not grumble. Oh, Lord, I see myself here. As some of them grumbled and were destroyed by the destroyer. We're all in here, aren't we? All these things that were happening to them had meaning as examples, and they were written down to warn us to whom the end of the ages has come. There's a word for end in the Greek New Testament that really means the goal. So you think of soccer goalposts or, or you think of, of uh, football goalposts, basket. Every, every sport has some kind of goal like that. And that's the end that all of this is aimed for. In the Great Commission, when the Lord says to his church to disciple all the ethnic groups, literally, by baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to guard and treasure all things as many as commanded, He says, surely I will be with you all the days to the gathered goal of the age. It's a literal translation. It's like all of time, if it feels sometimes like it's one big vortex swirling around, well, God knows when all of that will come down to that final moment, the gathered goal of the age is Christ. When all the living and all the dead will stand before him in the judgment, That's the goal. God's goal to get you there safely, in faith, caring for you along the way. And part of doing that meant warnings along the way. Like, let him who thinks he stands be careful that he doesn't fall. It's too easy for pastors and congregational leaders, men and women, to begin to think that maybe somehow our service to our Savior and the saints gets us in better with God. It's like when someone says, Pastor, will you pray for me or someone because I know that you can... And I, we have to say, your prayers as a believer in Jesus are every bit as powerful as mine. But we have this just ingrained in our nature. And when when we keep on going down that road and don't hear the day-by-day call to repentance as pastors and church leaders, some have fallen into grievous sins. The sin of self-righteousness, constant, constant battle. But the sin of idolatry and greed and the love of money that has cost some their freedom and sexual sins as well. But the one who thinks he's standing firm, be careful that he doesn't fall. Likewise, congregations. It's too easy for congregations to answer surveys. Are you a friendly congregation? Oh, yes, we're friendly. Ask their guests? No, not really. (laughs) Because they're friendly with each other. We're friendly. We tend to be with the people we know, not looking for those that we don't know, including those who are different in our community. It is too normal for this sinful heart to look at the face, to be prejudiced, 
When the Lord says, don't show favoritism, he's literally saying, don't look at the face. We are prejudiced sometimes. We are discriminating sometimes when we look for people like us and favor people like us and forget that God says he wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. When we get so wrapped up in our own affairs that we forget the needs of our community and just set justice aside because we've never suffered injustice, it's not to be the whole, the whole be-all, end-all for the Christian church today, as some of you I know have heard every sermon about justice. And it's always about earthly justice, man's justice. There's a justice with God, too. He punishes every single sin on Jesus, on his Christ. That's why that doesn't scare us. All my guilt, all yours, the guilt of the entire world. Isaiah 53, you know, 700 years before Christ, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, the guilt, all on him, fully paid. That's God's justice. That's his mercy. That's what sets us free to love those around us and to be faithful to our faithful God. How many young people have stood before God's altar as confirmands, catechism kids, promising lifelong love to God and faithfulness to him, even in the face of persecution and death? But then... Then come other relationships. Then comes compromise of the truth that they were taught. Compromise set aside and even the sacraments set aside just because they like somebody else's music better. See how quickly idolatry sets in? None of us are exempt. Let the one who thinks he's standing firm be careful that he or she does not fall. God is faithful. Aren't you glad God is faithful to the point of sending his son to be our Lord and Savior? He says no testing has overtaken you except ordinary testing. So when you're going through times of trial and trouble, you just feel like maybe God is angry at you and this is all coming down on you and you may even say, why me, Lord? One of the great comforts is that's that's your pain and it's real. But it's not so out of the ordinary. I mean, just think back. Think back if you need to, or think now if you're in grade school yet, but the teachers that you will remember are the ones that are tough, that insist that you learn. They keep pushing you beyond what you would really like to. If you ever have the experience of a class is like, uh, they were experimenting with that when I was in in, uh, junior high, you can work at your own pace. Well, your pace quickly drops off. That's just the way it is. Or no tests. Used to do the seminary that way for the Wisconsin Synod. Time I got there, they learned from that. There will be tests and to this day, and life is a test. Isn't that true? Coaches, the ones that take it easy on the team are just looking for losing teams. But the ones that drive you along with the whole team, not just to get in shape, but to be able to work together as a team and win, those are the ones you remember. Coach, you say jump, I only ask how high. Those are the ones you love. God knows all about that. No testing has taken hold of you except ordinary testing, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. He's not trying to bend you and break you like a pencil. His testing is always meant to strengthen. Strengthen like, uh, 
metal that, that is tempered the steel so that it will hold a solid edge or gold that is purified so that the dross can be scraped off and thrown away. You know, the, the goldsmith that was asked, how long do you heat the gold in the crucible? And he says, until I can see my face. God wants to see his image in you. He wants your kindness to be like his. He wants your mercy to overcome your judgment. He wants you to measure to others the kindness and love of God and not the judgmental thoughts that come so naturally to all of us. God is faithful. You won't be tested beyond your ability. When he tests you, he will also bring about an outcome that you're able to bear it. Outcome or an escape It's good to be able to think of that at times, Lord. (laughs) You know when the moment is when this whooping can be done. Help me learn my lessons. And the Lord God grant me relief and strength until then. And, And he does. Jesus said that. The rock says, also, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry and the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. Free refills of word and sacrament as we come to the word, whether here or you in the privacy of your home, Bible studies, and in a verse following, whoever comes to me, Jesus says, I will never drive away. He wants all to come. And I love those verses as recorded in page 7 and 8 in the worship folder from Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We sang that, didn't we? It's in the liturgy. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. Not stubborn pride. Seeking Him in humility. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears attentive to their cry. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and He delivers them. One of our sisters in Christ found that out in college and wished she'd have known it when she was young. And I think there's many soldiers that have gone into combat. If only they had known this, they would have done better coming out. The angel of the Lord is there camping around them and delivering them, either here on earth or forever in heaven. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears them, he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Bring it. Bring your broken heart because the Lord saves those who are crushed in spirit. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. He redeems his servants. The Lord says that a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets up again. The wicked are overcome by calamity. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God did what no one else could imagine, not even the angels, because in Peter it says they long to look into these things too, that he could punish and be holy by volunteering in the person of his own son to suffer the full wrath of God. We heard that before, God did not spare his son. That means he did not spare him the suffering and the pain either of the full wrath of God. Jesus said, bring it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So your debt is paid. Your mortgage on that mansion in heaven is full and free. You can bring your guilt day by day to Jesus and leave it at the altar. Leave it with him in your prayers and get up from that no weight, no pain, no reason to turn away from Christ our rock who is always with us and love is more than anything to comfort, guide, and bless. So live. Love. Love. And joy, Jesus, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We confess our faith together, Nicene Creed, pages 10 and 11. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. All things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to all businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. In love, we pray, dear Lord, for our sister Alberta Childs. As she's gone now into comfort care and hospice, we pray that you will continue to grant her that glowing faith that looks forward to resting with you, dear Jesus, and all our loved ones as you care for us body and soul and lead us on from grace to glory. O oh Lord, be with each of us, especially as we pass through the valley of the shadow of death. Let it always be, Lord Jesus, your presence there, our rock to guide and bless us. We pray too, dear Lord, for those who are struggling in their faith, for those who don't have faith at all, for those, dear Lord, who have a faith in something far different than you or God or your holy word, turn all hearts to you, dear Lord Jesus, since you died for all and paid the debt of all. Use us as a congregation and as individuals to bring this glorious faith, this glorious salvation to others, Lord, as you, the faithful God, have punished our sins already and now want to provide in love and mercy. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions in a moment of silent prayer. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. In the paragraph on page 12, I think if you looked at that, as most of the world would, it's pretty insane. (laughs) Asking people that are giving to support a congregation also to help the needy in their community. And it's insane for the congregation, because after all, if you give other places, there will be less for the congregation, right? (laughs) And you know better. Ah, fools for Christ. That's okay. He is so generous and gracious to us that you have known by experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be (laughs) rich and overflowing. We bring our offerings forward to give them to the Lord. We continue with the sacrament on page 13. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. The love note on the distribution, pages 14 and on to 15, our guests can read. And then we come to the Lord's table, prepared and ready to receive his blessing, his grace. Come for all things are now ready.
Our thanksgiving as we get ready to go in peace is on page 15. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Um.